Hi, my name is Andy Durham, and in the next half hour, we're going to look at analytics in tennis, perception versus reality, and how analytics can improve communication with the players and parents, and also improve your players' performance. In this session, we want to explore the history of analytics in tennis and how it was and currently is being used at all levels of the game to help improve the communication and player performance. One thing I'd like to stress, and that is, this is just a tool. It's not designed to tell you how to teach, it's to give you the ammunition to teach. Every other major sport uses match analytics as the beating heart of their operation. Tennis is just arriving at that tipping point. Now, this is a quote from Craig O'Shaughnessy from Brain Game Tennis and Tennis Analytics, who is now considered the leader in tennis analytics in, in the world. Analytics came to the forefront in America with the publication of Michael Lewin's book, Moneyball, and the movie that followed with Brad Pitt. Of course, the focus was on Major League Baseball that had been keeping statistics for years, but it really focused the other sports on the possibilities as well. And you might say that got the ball rolling. One of the advantages of analytics is that it shows players that they're getting better. Players that are getting better tend to be more focused and tend to stay in the game longer. Now, keeping kids in the game is a priority. Why? Well, the kids who do play tennis tend to get A's and B's in school. They tend to go to college. They do community service. They are less prone to being overweight and it helps them deal with the stress of the teenage years. So why do our kids leave tennis? Well, every year we get thousands of kids to join us, but we also lose thousands. Now, I'm sure most of you have your own ideas on why they leave, but one of the reasons is that there are a lot of competition from other sports and, of course, video games. Uh, this perce perception of a lack of fun and activity. Peer pressure is a big one. Slowing, uh, slow learning curve is possibly another one. Frustration with competition. Knowing their strengths and weaknesses are, and produces uh, a lack of confidence. And not really sure if they're improving. So here is the happy face that we would all like to see. Analytics is something you might want to add to your toolbox for the following reasons. First of all, they're objective. Players, parents, and coaches tend to trust them. Stats don't teach you how to teach. They just measure the areas that you want to teach. It builds player confidence by showing them their strengths and their weaknesses. And it shows the amount of improvement in each one of those areas. It puts more importantly, players, parents, and coaches on the same page, and it builds the team atmosphere, increases teams' motivation and retention through measurable goals. So to better understand where we are today, let's take a journey into yesteryear. Now one can only imagine the types of notes that were handed to players in the beginning. But in 1932, just as the Great Depression was beginning to recover, a player by the name of Bitsy Grant entered UNC Chapel Hill. The summer before, he had won the Georgia State Championships, and he became good friends with another student by the name of Bruce S. Old. Now, Bitsy Grant was only five foot six tall, and he had trouble covering the net, so he asked his friend to see if he could figure out, um, help him along in, in getting to the net and his effectiveness up there. So Mr. Old came along with a lot of paper and started charting shot directions and keeping track of that sort of information for him. Well, back then, tournaments were five sets long and there was a break after the third set. So often, Mr. Old would take these charts into the locker room at the break in the third set and show Bitsy where his opponent was hitting the passing shots. Now that was the beginning of Mr. Old's fascination with charting tennis. 
Now here are the two players responsible for setting up analytics as we know them today. Bruce S. Old, of course, who was the master charter, and Bill Talbert. Now, Bill Talbert, many of you will remember from his broadcasts on TV, but he was also a very top, very much of a top player at the time. Now, after World War II, Mr. Old uh, had served in the Navy research. He went back to his home in Concord, Massachusetts, where he played doubles, as did most of his friends. He started looking for books on doubles, and he checked the local library, the Boston Library, New York Library, and the Library of Congress, only to find out that there weren't any. So he started going to Longwood Cricket Club, which is just outside Boston, and he designed a system for charting. They were hosting the National Doubles Championships at the time, so he was set up the system to follow the serve, the return, how players opened up the court, and how they, where they hit their winners. Now this continued for four years. And after four years, he actually started writing the draft for his book, but he had trouble publishing it. That's when he ran into Bill Talbert. Bill Talbert was interested in his project and eventually convinced his friend, Henry Holt, to publish it. When it was published, it sold over 50,000 copies. Now, eventually these two wrote an additional three books and they each sold about 50,000 copies. It became the Bible for tactics for singles and doubles of the day. And here are the two books. The first one, uh, The Game of Doubles in Tennis, and the last one, The Tactics of Singles and Doubles. All of them were very successful. Here are two examples of the charts that they produced in their books. Uh, the one on the left is uh, just a diagram of where you might want to hit your first volley after serving to the deuce court. Now the top right corner, of course, is where you'd want to hit them. Uh, you do not want to hit them in the middle. You can hit them short to left and right. But in their notes to the left, you'll find that it shows you the preferences and things to work on. In the second one, this is actually a match between um, Ch uh, Chuck McKinley and Alex Amato uh, at the US Open. And they were hitting, uh, this is just a diagram of one of the sample points. Where you see the dark lines is where the, where the player actually hit the ball, but the dotted lines are where they actually move to. Of course, many of you have probably designed your own systems, but here are just a couple of hand charting systems that are easy to follow. Uh, the one on the left is simply a number of columns and you winners are in first and errors are in second, or in this case, first and second serves, uh, ground strokes on the second column, winners and errors. So you can kind of total things up and figure out where things uh, are going right and where they're going wrong. Now, the other one is an example of what um, more like what Mr. Old did, and that is he drew arrows showing, in this case, return to serve or ground strokes. On a, and you can tell where the errors are as well as by drawing the line out or placing it where it landed in the court. But in 1983, the era of the computer started and it changed everything. Bill Jacobson founded CompuTennis in 1983. He was a former South African player who graduated from the University of Stanford and had been applying computer technology to projects involving geophysical exploration. In late 1982, he started charting matches for his son, who was a ranked player in Northern California. At first, he hand-fed collected data into a microcomputer but with the advent of the first real laptop, the HX120 by Epson, he had it modified so that the score could enter 10 times more information and CompuTennis was born. Now, eventually this system was used by the USDA, the Fed and Davis Cups for several countries, major tournaments like Wimbledon, US, French Open, and other top tournaments, as well as over 10 universities hundreds of coaches, and by 1986, 
Over 5,000 players had been charted. I headed up a team of scores um, for the U, um, HBO presentations at Wimbledon, the Pilot Pen, and the USTA National Tournament at Kalamazoo. And I still have match printouts for the likes of Martin Blackman, Jay Berger, Aaron Crickstein, John and Patrick McEnroe, and a lot of others when they were in their eight, late teens. Now, CompuTennis had a relationship with IBM into the 1990s with a main scorer, Leo Levin, who passed away recently. But sadly, CompuTennis is no longer around today, but it left the door open for the next generation of analytics. And here is the CT120 that I used at Wimbledon, Kalamazoo, US Open. Uh, it's just barely alive today, but that original computer, which was the HX120 by Epson, is in the Smithsonian because it was considered the first viable word processing, processing laptop ever made. Now this would have been one of the printouts that we would have used from that uh, computer. And this particular match is between Yvonne Lendl and Boris Becker. It was held at Madison Square Garden, and that was in 1986. Uh, one of the things that you might notice is that a lot of these statistics here are the same statistics that are being used today. Um, for instance, uh, the serve, and in this case, we have all right, we have the uh, first serve percentage. We also have the effectiveness of the first serve. And you can see here's the total, but then the deuce court and the add court between the two players. And then second serve, the percentage lost and won for both players. And you can see uh, it's amazing, but Lendl actually outplayed Becker, who was one of the best servers at the time. On the return of serve, you can see the we keep track of the first serve percentage, you know, that won, and the second serve, and how they won them and lost them. And of course, we keep the forehands and backhands in play. Ground strokes, net, net clay, and eventually the unforced error rate and overall win error ratio. Now, the win error ratio is something that was sort of new. You compare your winners and you subtract all your errors and you make a ratio out of that. And in this case, you can see that Lendl's was uh, pretty effective. He um, hit just not quite as many winners as he made errors. Of course, many of you are familiar with Craig O'Shaughnessy. He's considered the leader of analytics today. Um, he's behind the brain game tennis but he also works with Warren Pretorius of Tennis Analytics, and they produce a system of software and analytics that you can get trained in and use to do the same kind of charting as you see the professionals use. Now, if you were a top ranked player, you'd have access to statistics that are financially sort of out of reach for the rest of us. Uh, examples would be Brain Game Tennis, Golden Set Analytics, Tennis Australia's Game Insight Group, uh, Tennis Analytics, Sporty Analytics, the SAP with Hawkeye and the WTA, Infosys with Hawkeye and the ATP, uh, IBM's Watson with the USTA, and finally a wonderful uh, system of match charting uh, through Jeff Sackman. Fortunately for the rest of us, there are now developing a lot of lower cost systems. Uh, PlaySight is one of them with PlaySight Pro and PlaySight Go. Uh, Tennis Analytics, iSport Analysis, NAC Sport, and Swing Vision. Thank goodness the arrival of the smartphone. Here you have examples of apps that you can get both at Android and uh, Apple for your smartphone that allow you to get many of the same statistics that you've just seen. Uh, they go down math analytics, math statistics, math <clears throat> tennis tracker, tennis stats, tennis match tracker and racket stats. All of these are available uh, for you to use 
Now, sorting through them is something else. Some are a little easier to learn than others. Some are much more complicated and produce, but they produce many more statistics. So it's up to you to kind of find something that's out there that will fit your budget and also work on your program. Now, last Saturday, there was a, a video workshop with uh, Robert Davis called Empowering the Tennis Parent. And it was presented by the Angie Kerber Academy. It was talking about parent involvement and how crucial it was. Parents of successful tennis players all differ in how they do it, but their involvement is the same. We need them behind us and part of the team because uh, if they are not part of the team, they can very well torpedo a lot of your work. Now, Max Mirny uh, was a top ranked player. And when he was interviewed, he said that up until the mid teenage years, he really wasn't sure why he played, but he knew he played for his daddy. And that was enough to get him started. The passion and stuff that parents and the discipline that they put in is usually transferred to the child. Uh, they, they oversee all the decision-making, uh, the execution of getting ready the, the player ready for tournaments, the entry fees, and dealing with all the ups and downs afterward in that horrible car ride home. Important to all of the pros of, uh, <clears throat> is that we make sure that they are on our side. We want to keep them there, and by giving them the responsibility of charting matches, that gives them a part, an important part on the team, and it helps pull them so that they understand, uh, they see the same information that we see, and it helps pull them on the team. Now, I forgot to mention that uh, one of the other useful areas other than analytics were websites. There are not a lot of websites for parents, and one of them is called Parenting Aces, run by Lisa Stone, and you might want to check that out. Most of the apps that are in the market today are pretty easy to learn, but you may want to use um, a training session for your parents, players, and staff to help them understand how to get the information in there and what it means. Now, from this group of people that you train, you can find volunteers, and these volunteers, of course, can charge for their services. As I mentioned before, if parents are not part of the team, they can torpedo your efforts. Now, by using analytics, they'll see what you see and are much more likely to support your program. However, gathering this information can be difficult. Most of you are too busy teaching to actually do the charting. However, if you run a match play program and you happen to be wander, you know, watching the kids, you can have two kids play in front of you for one set and then rotate them around and do another two. Now this generally will take 20 to 30 minutes a match. Barring that, if you can find some volunteers, the volunteers can do the same thing and they can chart full matches uh, in the one hour session or one and a half hour sessions that you're actually running. Now team coaches um, have so little time for any of this. Uh, that they really need to find volunteers. Uh, I would suggest doing something early in the season so you, the players become familiar with the charting system and uh, the information that comes from it. And then during the season, um, you take Stanford University when they used it in the 80s, they looked for volunteers from the student body. Um, they taught them how to chart. And of course, the benefit to the coach is invaluable because you can visit these scores during the match, pick up pointers about a particular match and pass it on to your players. It also allows you to focus on what a player really needs and develop um, a plan of action for each of them that's quite different from player to player. And of course, it gives you valuable information about your opponents scouting so that when the end of the season comes and the playoffs, you've got that information handy. Now, before we go uh, into the conclusion, I'd like to pass along a couple stories on how you can use statistics with your students. Uh, the first instance would be a, <clears throat> a boy that I worked with who was in the semifinal of the Canadian Open against a European fellow that I hadn't seen before. Um, he ended up losing in a fairly close match. And after the match, we analyzed the data. 
And it ended up that uh, Joey's first serve was uh, effective as usual, but he was getting killed on second serves. Well, it just so happened that they ended up meeting in the uh, semifinals of the US Open a month later. And this time we instructed Joey to go out and get a higher percentage of first serves in so the other fellow couldn't take advantage of him. And he ended up winning the match. That's one instance. Uh, another simple instance is uh, um, another one of my students uh, considered his serve to the ad court a lot better than his serve to the deuce court. However, in the charting of the match, I noticed that he was actually losing more points to the ad court than he was the deuce court. And in looking at it, uh, he would serve wide and every one of his shots that followed up went to the forehand corner or the what perceived as the open court. And the other course, that was the guy's forehand. Well, all I had to do was instruct him to, hey, mix it up a little bit. Uh, don't always go to the open court, hit behind him and a simple change like that and he ended up winning the match. So in conclusion, uh, stats are believable. Um, you get your coaching, uh, gives you the ammunition to develop different areas of the game, which is of course your decision. Uh, you can develop personal lesson plans so that not all players are treated the same. And you have a report card that you can all send out to parents and players so that they understand what's uh, where the student stands and that things are getting better. It improves your communication with parents, which I think is very important, and allows the team of parents, players, and uh, you to work together in unison. And it improves player confidence and motivation. Uh, they know they're getting better, so they're gonna stay at it and focus better. Uh, it's also an excellent scouting tool and you can use the scouting tool to build information on players as you go to tournaments or the parents go to tournaments and that way you have this information at your fingertips. I believe the University of Southern California many years ago used to keep information on all the players from outside the section. So when they came in there, they had information on these outside players and what their strengths and weaknesses were. Last thing is, of course, that it'll make your program stand out as different from everybody else's. So in conclusion, thank you very much. I appreciate the time that you've spent with us, and I hope you find that this is useful.